I'll do some housekeeping details while everyone's getting logged on. This is a webinar, it is recorded. It's recorded so that you can see it later. We'll put it on the portal um, and make it accessible to you all if you need to share it. Um, we'll have um, it on the resources tab. If you wanna put questions in the Q&A as we go, please feel free to do that. We'll address them at the end. I think that will be great. We'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. If you wanna put anything in the chat, immediately go ahead and do that as well. We'll, we'll be monitoring that and we'll stop the presenters if there's anything in, in the middle that we wanna make sure we address. Um, we'll try and keep major questions till the end um, as per usual. Um, we have a couple of panelists today so we can watch and monitor the, the chat as we go. Um, I'm really happy to see everyone starting to join. I'm going to get started. We have a big packed agenda today. I know that it's just at the, at, at the top of the hour, but um, hopefully some of the news won't be as exciting as the scientific presentation we're about to share. So welcome to our September webinar and workshop. It's great to see you all. I hope fall is treating you all well. Um, and um, I hope that, you know, everything is healthy in your lives as you start to uh, merge into the fall and pumpkin season as it were. So today, um, we have a nice, exciting agenda. I'm gonna start off with a little bit of news from the network and what's to come, what I typically do in these sessions, um, just to give you a flavor for what's happening um, in the entire platform and across the space. I'll talk a little bit about the program, the AMP Partnership in Common Metabolic Disease Program broadly. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Pearl, who is going to introduce and give an overview of the Common Metabolic Diseases Genome Atlas, which is really why we're all here and I'm really excited today because the release just happened. This is really fresh and extremely exciting. So with that, I'm gonna start with some of the news of the network and then I'll turn it over to Paul. So it's been some, you know, the summer is always a time for us to think about, you know, what are the most important things to do as we pause and evaluate where we're headed. And also the fall is fun because one of our big conferences, the American Society of Human Genetics is coming up. And so we think about what are the most important things for us to be focusing on. So in terms of news from the network, um, our next webinar, which we keep our, our cadence of every other month, we had to shift it a little bit from November because November has a lot of Thursday holidays, it turns out. So our next webinar is actually going to be October 28th, um, same time and same everything, same webinar in Zoom. Um, we're going to have a fantastic presentation from our cardiogram colleagues because we have their effector gene predictions on the portal and integrated. And that's the subject of a meta archive manuscript. They're going to come talk about the method, the approach, and the data underlying it, and then we'll talk about how you can browse that on the portal. So that should be a really nice webinar. I hope you can tune in for that. And then December, stay tuned for what that will hold in store for you. In terms of workshops, ASHG, like I said, it's always my favorite time of the year. We can't do the booth this year because it's not gonna be in person, which makes me sad because I love seeing you all in person, but we have an ancillary session like we always do. It's gonna be October 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. The goal that we to talk about genetic, epigenomic, and functional approaches to identifying effector genes for complex diseases. Kicked off with Anna Gloin giving the, the, the lead speech, um, Brent Richards, Krishna, Krishna Agaram, and Jason Flanick will be our speakers, and I'll be emceeing. It's sure to be a great um, session featuring the Ant CMD initiative, but also other things from the community that are relevant to common metabolic diseases. So be, be sure to tune into that if you are going to ASHG. If not, afterwards, hopefully we'll post it and you can see it on our, our site. So other news from the network, the team is changing and growing as, as, as often. This is again, a multi-site team, but we were sad to bid adieu to two of our favorite team members, um, Jeff Massong and Liz Calkins have both gone on to awesome, awesome career adventures. We'll miss them, but we welcome some new folks, Mackenzie Brandis and Tron Nugin. And Aoife McMahon have all joined us across the different sites, and we're really happy to have them. And you'll be hearing from them and seeing them as we present on the portal going forward. So that's some nice changes and, and advances. So resources, some things I want to tell you about are some of the exciting things, not just for the portal, but within our community. If you want to find all those, those are in our resources tab on the portal right here. Um, one thing that's new and notable is something that um, I think is unique to our platform. As you know, the Knowledge Portal alone is just one piece of a broader activity. And this is a funding opportunity I wanna make you all aware of. So the AMP, Accelerating Medicines Partnership for Common Metabolic Diseases, you know, the, the, plat the portal is just a piece of that. And this um, per partnership is an expansion of our initial partnership that brought you the Types Diabetes Portal in types, AMP Types Diabetes. But this public-private partnership between the NIDDK and four pharmaceutical industry partners 
um, is really set to have a mission to find promising new targets for common metabolic diseases. And this covers six major areas, not just diabetes, type two diabetes. So we're expanding. And so what's nice about this is that the NIDDK has a very large investment in four major awards that it's already funded to achieve this effort. And we're hoping our industry partners will also come to the table with other um, awards that will supplement this initiative. But the NIDK is a very unique mechanism for this and makes this program very unique. We have what's called an opportunity pool. And within our consortium, the NIDK supplies $500,000 annually across the five years, totaling $2.5 million for new projects that support and enhance the mission of AMP CMD. And what's really exciting about this is this allows us an opportunity to look at our current funded portfolio and look for gaps, places where we don't have the right collaborators, the right investigators, or the right resources to really achieve our mission. So we looked across that over the last year, and we said, where are our gaps? And one of the major gaps we found was in resources for functional characterization that would be widely applicable across a broad range of tissues and cell types for common metabolic diseases. So what we're hoping to do um, with a deadline of October 25th is to fund a set of proposals in that particular theme. And that's gonna be dedicated to our first million dollars of the opportunity pool um, from the first two years of the award. So it's an opportunity. It's a not a huge, heavy-handed R1 type application. It's a three-page application, a budget justification and a budget, and a 10-minute presentation um, that you upload and that will be reviewed. And we hope to award these people early in, um, late in 2021. If you have any questions about that, the, the email website is right down there. It's on the portal. You can peruse it. There's a handbook, an FAQ, all the things you need to, to apply. And you can also just contact me or that email that's listed right there. This is a really cool opportunity. Remember, the portal is not just a, a research, a software platform. It's also a research community. And that's really what's really exciting about this. This allows us to bring in new investigators that aren't already part of the program. It's a very cool, cool opportunity, no pun intended. So with that, also research and partnering. Um, I, many of the resources that you have online that you use in your research um, need to be leveraged. They're domain expertise in certain areas. And we find that one of the best things that we can do across the field is partner with different resources that do different things better than we do. And one place we've done some really cool partnering recently is across our type one diabetes knowledge portal, where we've been contacted by um, the folks at DKNet, which is another resource from the NIDDK to have a repository for all the resources online um, associated with, with diabetes and digestive kidney disease to bring together that with Sugar Sciences, which is a nonprofit organization, to do what's called the D challenge. And this is a community research challenge. It really is a, an approach to ask researchers, you all, and this prize money, to look across the resources for type one diabetes that are online right now, the bioinformatic resources, the websites, the portals, and to come up with better hypotheses for the genes involved in type one diabetes, the mechanism and the function. And this is beautiful. It's right in the wheelhouse of the type one diabetes knowledge portal. So for that, we're partnering with several other places, places you've seen, and the goal is to, to set these researchers off for a two-month endeavor to use these resources to come up with new hypotheses for type 1 diabetes. We are participating in as a resource, but also as research investigators participating to generate our own hypothesis. If you're interested, register by September 30th. There's a boot camp and there's some online. You can find it on our website, and it's sure to be really fun if you're interested. If you have any bioinformatician in your group that's keen to do this, I, I suggest they join. Really cool. So on the horizon for not only the AMP CMD portal, but for the broader um, platform that supports this, both the portals for common metabolic disease, but other complex diseases that we built portals in, and also for our research portals that are for specific organelles or specific syndromes. Research development. So a couple of things, a couple of highlights I want to do before we turn it over to our main speaker. One is our effector genes. This tends to be our major wheelhouse. This is one of the things that differentiates us from many of the other large scale resources out there. And we are very lucky to work with experts who understand the particular disease domain and all the generated resources within them to generate effector genes. And so we have that for type 2 diabetes already on the portal, as you've seen, for cardiovascular disease. So soon we're going to be working with Kyle and his team to represent a curated list of effector genes for type 1 diabetes. So look for that coming soon. Moreover, expanding our mesoskeletal knowledge portal to do the exact same for osteoarthritis. 
Um, the, the paper that recently came out from Elliot Zidini and colleagues does a beautiful job of doing this. Those results will be integrated on the portal and will also present the results of the heuristic and the um, effector genes presented in that paper in a user interface on the portal like we've done before. Expanding to other common diseases, um, many of you know we have the ALS portal that's been around for a while. We really want to expand that to make that a, a platform for neurodegenerative disease, partnering with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other associated diseases to bring that to a larger portal that expands to new communities with the same platform. Beyond just um, non-added effects, we're going, to, we're going to expand our portal to um, other types of genomic uh, models, uh, genetic models. So working with Josette Mecador, who's just recently published, published a paper on this, we're going to expand our portal to allow us to visualize and represent these results on the portal because these are slightly different than the classic you know, associations that we represent in the portal right now. Um, they require different UI and different way of analyzing them. And so this will also include non added effects, but also pleiotropy and other types of genetic models. So look for that coming in the, in, in the coming months. So broader directions. So just shifting now, and then this brings us to our presentation. Broader directions of the portal. So I think the portal's done a really great job. All of the, you know, the types of diabetes portal and the other associated research portals for common metabolic diseases and complex diseases, I think they've done a great job of representing human genetics data. So what we've been learned from genetic discovery through GWAS and sequencing for the genes and the regions associated with a given phenotype. And the state of affairs in our community is that there are 100,000 associations like this out there, type diabetes being one of them, obesity, coronary artery disease. We have a treasure trove, if you will, of loci we've identified. And the challenge here is to prioritize genes and variants from those loci. So the portal does a great job of representing human genetics data, but what's next? So to that, I'm gonna channel Kyle, um, and because he, he wasn't here to give this presentation, and this will give us a lead into Carl's de demonstration, is that most of these associations of risk variants are non-coding regions. And so to determine the function of non-coding risk variants, it's critical to understand the types of cell types, genes, pathways involved. And this requires effective annotation of the genome, the epigenome, and the gene function. And to that end, the portal itself did a great job of human genetics, but what about these annotations? So several years ago, we were very lucky that the NIDDK and the FNIH invested in building a sister resource called the Diabetes Epigenome Atlas to annotate and bring in non-coding annotations across four major classes of annotations that are relevant to help you prioritize genes and variants from these loci that have been identified. And so that resource was built to house that data, but also connect with the knowledge portal for human genetics and represent those in an integrative manner to allow you to start to prioritize genes and variants. So the resource started um, to, and was very successful and started with about 3,500 genomic annotations, some of which were only found in DGA, nowhere else, covering these four major annotation blocks that were represented on the, the DGA resource. However, the next phase of AMP DMD and our field is that we need to expand um, for common metabolic diseases from just diabetes to common metabolic diseases. We're gonna to continue to generate epigenomic and transcriptomic data using single cell assays to help us understand the risk variants in these canine genes and link them, and then generating gene perturbations in cells and animal models to understand gene function. And then moreover, modeling of networks and pathways so we can understand the cellular function and the disease risk. So the challenge here is to increase the scale and by diversity um, and effectively represent these data in a way that a user can prioritize genes and variants. And these are, much of this data is going to be generated by the AMP CMD consortium of the, of the coming years and more broadly by the community. So our goal is to expand the resource to do just that. And today we're very lucky to have Pearl come talk to us about what they've done converting the, the DGA resource to the CMD G, G, DGA resource. And what's really great is Pearl actually did all this work. She's been working with us, I think, with four years almost. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. But she's really been um, the backbone of what you're going to see today. And it's been really great to work with her because she's also been pivotal in, in combining and, 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 and connecting the AMP CMD resource, the KP that we have, with the DGA. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Perul. Stop sharing um, unless there's a major burning question. Ah, I'll, um, I'll answer this in the Slack. So Perul, okay, Perul we'll turn it over to you. Beautiful. Uh, thank you, Noel, for the introduction. And you're right. I'm working with you guys for the past four years since 2000. Awesome. You're right on that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, yeah, also thank you for setting a great stage and introduction for my presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm Parul. And today's presentation is, oh, okay, let me share my slides. Yeah, that'd be great. You should go through the slides yourself because I won't do a good job advancing them as you would. <laughs> Perfect, we can see your screen. You can, right? And you can yep. do me. Perfectly. Okay, um, so today's presentation is focused on new data types and visualization tools in common metabolic disease genome atlas or CMDG. The presentation will be followed by a brief demo of this new scientific resource. So just for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be referring to common metabolic diseases genome atlas as CMDGA and Diabetes Epigenome Atlas as DGA. So in 2017, we developed Diabetes Epigenome Atlas that was funded by Opportunity Pool to host diabetes relevant data for AMP T2D Consortium. As part of this resource, we have collected and processed sequenced data from thousands of epigenome assays and developed tools to intersect genetic variation with epigenomic annotations. We have also developed, as Noel mentioned uh, prior, um, a data sharing software platform with DG to enable data integration with the knowledge portal. Okay. So this is the new version of the previous slide addressing main challenges for the next phase of AMP CMDGA that Noel mentioned. So CMDGA has now replaced DGA. And one of the main goal of CMDGA is to include all data sets and tools from within CMDKP and facilitate collaborative data sharing with consortium members. This is the landing page of CMDGA that is using same framework and infrastructure as DG. At the end of this presentation, I will be doing a live demo of CMDG. It is fairly easy to navigate the site and access various tools and data types. As mentioned before, we have created infrastructure to represent New data, new data types such as single cell embeddings, gene perturbation, and statistical models, as well as complementary visualization tools to represent single cell embeddings and gene expression profiles. We have also expanded data analysis pipelines that will be linked to every data set in CMDG. At the moment, we have a handful of data sets for these new data types. But basically, we have created the framework and tools in preparation to host large scale and diverse functional genomic data sets that will be generated by AMP CMD consortium members. So this uh, is the example. The example here shows single cell embedding for type one diabetes risk. Various research labs are generating large number of single cell assays, such as accessible chromatin, 3D chromatin interaction, methylation, histone modification. Um, this is the year or maybe perhaps the decade of single cell assays. The embedding page includes metadata link outs to single, in, in this case, single cell ataxic uh, assay that generated the embedding file and H585. The H585 file is composed of cell by feature matrix, metadata, uh, um, metadata such as cluster label and sample uh, for cell types and embeddings, which could be either UMAP or TSNE. The H5 Vady files are great because they can be used for visualization of these embeddings, single cell embeddings, as well as, in, as well as input to intermediate or downstream analysis toolkits to further analyze single cell profiles. 
we have also uh, created complementary tools for these single cell data data types. Um, one of the visualization tool that we are hosting is single cell browser, which is based off Celex gene. This is a scatter plot of cells embedded in two dimensions based on either gene expression or spatial coordinates. At the end of the presentation, I will be giving a demo of this browser. In addition for single cell data type, we have also developed a novel in-house visualization to visualize expression changes across different cell types. The primary visualization plot, as you can see on the screen, is dot plot, as well as you can visualize the information as heat map. I will be again doing a demo of this tool at the end of the presentation. One of the big goal of consortium is to study gene function and record significant genes. Hence the second data type that we have introduced is gene perturbation. We developed this data type with feedback from Anna Golan's lab at Stanford. This data type is manipulation of genes in cell and animal models using single cell knockout or genome-wide assays. The results are presented as downloadable text files for all genes tested, as well as list of significant genes. Finally, the third new data type we have introduced is statistical model, which can be used to model functional genomic data, such as genomic activity, gene function, et cetera. The statistical model in this example is uh, is uh, is PyTorch, which is a machine learning algorithm. Uh, here, uh, here on the screen, uh, we have Bassett, which predicts variant function. Bassett prediction results are also displayed on the knowledge portal. So this is how uh, we are linking uh, D, uh, CMDGA with CMDKP. And uh, one of our other primary goal is to have detailed pipelines for all data sets in CMDG, describing generation of processed or result or resulting files. So in this example, we have the ABC prediction pipeline that predicts enhanced promoter regulation for CRISPR perturbations. The analytical pipeline can be uh, provided as workflow script or GitHub link. You can also, on this page, you can also visualize the pipelines, the pipeline schematic that gives you the overview of each step along with software command line tools used for individual step. And, uh, the data deposited in CMDG can also be accessed through CMD. CMDKP will be soon sharing a document with the consortium members on how they can deposit data to CMDG. We are also working with consortium members to improve representation of data types and develop complementary visualization tools. We always appreciate your feedback. So uh, now we move on to demo for the site. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so Yingsun is the data manager on CMDGA. Uh, so if you have uh, if you have data to share, Kyle Galton is the principal investigator on CMDGA. Uh, he conceived, designed, and is directing CMPGA. If you have comments, ideas, get in touch with Kyle. Uh, we have, uh, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, we, we work closely with the amazing Knowledge Portal team, and uh, we have been great partners. They have been our great partners since 2017. And it was great pleasure working with the AMP T2D consortium. And we look forward to working with the AMP CMT consortium. 
Uh, so now I'll move on to the demo, the site demo. That was great, Paul. Thank you. I don't see any questions right now, so we'll keep going. Um, well, Pearl puts the site up a couple of things just also so you know if you actually go to the MCMDKP, you can see it on the homepage and get to it that way too. So yeah, there's two ways to get to it. Beautiful. Yeah. So this is the homepage, uh, a new homepage of CMDGA. On the landing page uh, via the search tool, you can search by keyword, PubMed ID, lab, or award. So I'm going to search for uh, diabetes risk. Uh, that's my keyword of interest. So you get all the data sets associated with the search keyword. You can also uh, filter the information by uh, uh, by filters on the left side of the panel. So I want to look at embedding data sets related to uh, the keyword that I just searched. So uh, let's go through uh, one of the new data set that we have, uh, data type that we have, which is embedding. So uh, just a quick overview, uh, embeddings are, ge are genomic profiles of individual cells derived from mul multiple single cell or single nuclei assays. Uh, this page, uh, this is the single cell uh, ATAC-seq uh, embedding from the diabetes risk paper. You can also access the publication uh, that generated this data. In addition, uh, you, you have metadata and link outs to the single ataxic uh, assay for this embedding, as well as downloadable H580 file. So these H580 files are composed of cell by feature matrix, metadata, and embedding coordinates. Um, so these files can be used for intermediate or downstream single cell analysis, as well as UMAP visualization. So we have also created complementary tools to visualize single cell embedding. And one of the tool is a UMAP browser. So let's visualize the UMAP for the embedding that um, that we just saw. So the UMAP is a scatter plot of cells embedded into dimension. Um, and this is for the single cell ATAC seq um, for the type one diabetes risk uh, embedding that we just, uh, that I just demoed. Uh, you can color the cell type by the filters on the left. So right now, the only filter available for this particular uh, data uh, is cluster. So you can, uh, you can color uh, the UMAP by cell type cluster. And you can also label it. You can select individual clusters and and visualize it for comparative analysis. Um, so this is for single cell ATAC-seq. For uh, single cell or single nuclei RNA-seq uh, or, or single cell uh, transcriptomic assays, you can also search by the gene and the UMAP can be colored by gene expression values to identify sub-cell population for the searched marker gene. So um, another complementary tool um, for visualizing single cell data that we have developed uh, in-house is, is a gene expression profiling app. So this is um, for the type one diabetes risk uh, paper. Uh, um, we just saw the embedding for that paper again, the embedding data set. So uh, 
in this uh, paper, one of the risk variant discovered was uh, located in CFTR locus. Uh, and it was specific to ductal cell. The expression was specific to ductal cell. So this visualization, as you can see, is a dot plot of gene expression across cell types. You can search for multiple genes and visualize their expression across multiple genes, as well as, so this is for all the cell types uh, that were found uh, in this study, but you can also visualize the same information for individual or group of cell types. You can download, uh, you can also download this Just a minute. Yeah, you can also download this uh, this dot plot uh, as an image file, as well as the information here as a CSV file. The second way you can visualize the same information is as a heat plot. So let's look at the same genes that we searched before. Um, cell type. So as you can see, uh, this, the, the CFTR expression in ductal cell is, uh, uh, is, 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 is quite high. So uh, you can also visualize the same information as a heat map. There is another uh, uh, search uh, filter on the left. Uh, you can select a cell type. And by default, it will display the heat map for top um, 25 to 500 genes. Again, you can download the heat map and the corresponding data set that you see on the heat map. Okay, back to the site. So you can uh, access different data types in CMDJ through the uh, drop-down menu, as well as the data, as well as the data menu. And all the all the data types that we have in CMDJ follow similar uh, similar uh, uh, infrastructure. That is, they have metadata. Uh, raw or process files, raw and or process files, and um, any supplementary information associated with the data set. Carl? Yeah? The question I think is relevant right now on the chat line. Um, this question says, we're trying to access chromatin profile data sets, bulk and signal cell linked at the DGA. Is there a way we can get programmatic access to scrape the DGA via API or some other mechanism? For example, an easy way to scrape metadata and the entire compendium for data. Uh, yeah, um, the, uh, so uh, uh, I'll answer that question in, uh, in two parts. Technically, Beautiful. yes, you can. We have a REST API, uh, but Logistically, uh, uh, you know, uh, we'll have to discuss this with Kyle um, so that we can provide you the REST API access to CMDJ. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible. You can scrape the data. So if I, to follow you right now, yes, but you have to sort of do some work to make it fully accessible. Is that what I was hearing? Yeah, that's correct. And, and also, uh, um uh, uh you know we, we'll have to uh, at the administrative level we'll have to uh, discuss this with Kyle you know if, um, if 
if that's uh, if we can do that but yeah yeah that's possible Got it. so theoretically i think the answer is yes we can i think that we have to make sure that we handle how we represent them and allow people to download different i mean I, I have programmatic access to things uh, needs to be sorted out specifically i think is what you're saying yeah yeah i mean yeah we have to uh, we have to figure out what we want to share and you know uh, within the consortium policies I think what we're going for some data pre publication is only for the consortium once it's published or once we release it. So I think those are the types of levels I think she's trying to say. Yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. I think the goal is yes, but currently no. We're not, we don't have an easy way to do that yet. But it's a great question. It's actually something that for the overall knowledge portal, we've been focusing on very, very heavily because it's an important pet piece. And for the stuff in the knowledge portal, we do have APIs um, for the data. And actually, for some of the annotations that we draw, from CMDGA now on the knowledge portal, you can get some of the results of those annotations on the portal, particularly the bioinformatic predictions. But for this, you have to build out that infrastructure. Yep, that's correct. Uh, and um, finally, I will go through infrastructure that we have created for uh, pipelines. So this is the so this is the pipeline for predicting. Enhancer promotion, enhancer promoter regulation, uh, uh, ABC pipeline, and uh, one of the principal goal for the next few months um, for CMDG is to collect and associate various pipelines uh, that were used to generate data sets in CMDG. Different data sets, if not unique, use multitude of variation in parameters to generate results. Hence, it is important to record data processing pipelines for each data set in CMDG. So uh, the pipeline uh, page has uh, metadata, uh, GitHub link, or workflow scripts uh, for the pipeline, as well as link out to all the data sets that were created using the pipeline and a schematic overview, which uh, gives a uh, detail for individual step in the pipeline. Finally, we have a concise user-friendly guide for CMDGA. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always get in touch with us. Thank you. So uh, um, I think I can take that. That's beautiful. It's always great when the live demo goes well. I love that. Also it speaks to the robustness of the site. <laughs> I don't often do them, so I get nervous. That's awesome. Um, folks, I'm going to open up for questions to folks um, as we go, because we have plenty of time for that. I saw some in the chat. We've dealt with all the ones that happened along the way. Um, one thing I will do actually is I will share my screen and show you a couple of things to sort of support some of the things Pavel was mentioning. So let me share my screen real quick. So again, if you're you know if you're more of a you're starting from the knowledge portal and you want to link to to CMDGA, you can find it here. But you can also, so where, where do we draw these annotations? And so this is one of the ultimate goals because you know, what, the, what the resource that Paul describes to you does a great job is warehousing the, the data associated with these annotations, presenting them in a way that it's concise and clear and maps you back to the, the manuscripts, the, the, the accession files, all of how you, into, the collaborator intended it to be used, but also presents unique visualizations of those data types. And what's beautiful about our mission is we're hoping to integrate genetics piece of the knowledge portal we've built and what they built at UCSD, mirroring that so you can actually prioritize genes and variants is a long haul. And for that, what we're hoping to do is start with visualizations, and so it means to present that and also take the data that's relevant and run bioinformatic methods that leverage the, those data sets and integrate them to help prioritize genes and variants and tissues of interest. So some of the ways in which this data is exposed currently on the portal, just to give you a flavor for that before we break, is if you go to a particular gene page or variant page, you'll see 
you know, you'll see these typical associations that you see at the top for all the traits in the portal for a given region. And what's known about the genetic evidence, and then you'll see about the variants in the region. Then down at the bottom is where we start to bring in annotations. So this is where you say for a genetic region or a locus, show me the associations, show me the credible sets, but also teach me about enrichments, teach me about what annotations overlap in my tissue of interest. So the data that you're, you're seeing here is the data warehouse in CNDGA. And over time, the richness of that integration to allow you to see the full results of for a given set of variants, what are the relevant annotations, what are the data sets that are in DGA that are important for me to pay attention to, married with the genetics will become present here. It gives you a sense if you're picking a, a tissue, you'll see the annotations layered for that. You'll have a set of different annotations that Carl was mentioned that you can layer on top of it. Then we'll also have fold enrichment. So methods run on that data with the genetic data. Right now we run Gregor over time will be LD screw regression and other ones where you can actually look for fold enrichment where things are enriched in a given, given, in a given tissue. So you would know what overlaps with your particular trait of interest. So this is one first place and this is going undergoing a massive overhaul right now within our, our multi-site teams to add all the data that the CMDGA has stored and warehoused into annotation representation and visualizations to help sort of make decisions across a given locus. And that's one of the places. The other places are at a given variant. You can see if you go to the variant page, the other places where annotations are represented is also here in the knowledge portal. You'll see for a given variant, again, the genetics presented at the top and then all of the different associations for the different, uh, the different traits we have in the portal. But then you'll also have the different bone binding motifs, which come from DGA as well, and the annotations that overlap. So this is where we bring this information together. But what's lovely is that we are not the experts in this, you know, where you, where you need to leverage the expertise that Kyle and his team have brought to this is where you would then leave here essentially and go to the CMDGA to actually get access to the relevant underlying data that is the resultant product in the portal. That's how we're marrying these two over time. And what's great is that, you know, we're now in sync on common metabolic diseases, not just type two diabetes, but all across those six major disease classes. Moreover, we're also putting investment because we have um, at the Broad investments in common metabolic, common disease in general, multiple skeletal disease, lung disease. Kyle's team is also working with us to help us bring in tissues and cell types relevant to that over time. So this is hopefully a, a, a large area of, of, of development for us and we hope to get your feedback um, tell us where you need data sets, where you see data sets that need to be brought in and that are valuable. Tell us visualizations. I think that's one of our key um, areas that we need development is how do you as a user want to understand and represent genetic and genomic annotations? Like what types of tools work for you and what don't? So we welcome any feedback for that. If you need that, go to our resources tab, click the, um, the help button and you can get a, a direct email to us and tell us what you're thinking and where um, we can be doing better. Um, any more questions? As you go, I haven't seen anything in the QA in the chat, but I will welcome the, the if you want to raise your hand or pop something in the chat, that's fine. If not, we can break early. Carl, anything else you want to show before we break? I think that's pretty much it. But mm -hmm. uh, if you guys have any question, get in touch with us. Beautiful. Yep. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, um, I think we'll end early, give you all 15 minutes to do whatever you want to do until your next meeting. Um, really thankful for everyone to join as well. It's great to see you all again. Um, tune in next time, actually, um, October 28th, same time. We'll hear from our cardiovascular disease research collaborators on the effect of genes for coronary artery disease, recent um, med archive paper that came out um, from Cardiogram with the largest GWAS for, for coronary artery disease and effector genes. And that's on the portal. Actually, I might as well, you know, give a little preamble for that. That's up here, predicted effector genes. If you want to see them right now, you have your type diabetes ones, you have your coronary artery ones, artery disease results right here. And that's on the portal for you to peruse and see the underlying evidence sources as well. So with that, thank you, Parl. It was beautiful. I'm so glad to have this resource and I'm so glad to work with you all and um, happy that we got to share it with you today. And we'll see you later, uh, actually next month. Thanks everyone. Take care. <laughs>